OK. Um, that's actually quite appropriate since we're going to be talking about contracts today. Um, so, so yeah, I'll let you guys um, um, make your call on that. Um, certainly, there's nothing to lose with short stories. The contract looked pretty decent um, that way. Uh, the big unknown factor in something like this is how much marketing they actually end up putting into it. What kind of act editing are you actually going to get? And with it just starting, there's no way for you to know. Um, fortunately, I did look at the contest, and entering the contest does not obligate you to sign the contract. Um, so you could enter the contest if you win. You could look at the contract and decide if it's something you want to go, um, go through with or not. Um, they seem like they're, they're very um, upfront, straightforward people. Um, there, is some there are a lot of people, though, in publishing who, are, um, who give people bad deals not because they are um, bad people, but because they have no experience of what a good deal is. And so they just make a deal. They've worked in another industry, perhaps, um, and they just assume that, that that sort of contract is standard everywhere or whatever. There are a lot of well-meaning people who, um, who, don't, um, who don't do a good job. Um, and that can be just as bad as someone who's trying to scam you. Uh, today, though, we will talk about uh, one of the main things is we're going to talk about, you're actually in the class. You don't have a seat? It's fine. I like these. You like this one? OK, you're cool. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about how to get an agent. We've basically covered all of this, but we'll talk. We'll do any questions you have on publishing or agents. Uh, we'll talk about how to avoid getting scammed and all those sorts of things. Um, do we need another chair? Okay, go grab a chair. It's fine. Anytime you want to grab a chair, or if you want to sit on the floor. Uh, there is one s one more seat in here if you want to come in and sneak around the uh, around right there if that's a what's that oh yeah there's this one too you want this chair I'm not going to be sitting so just pull that over there and have a seat um, so one thing to remember is uh, boy what is this thing called someone's going to tell me is it Poe's law. Um, money flows toward the author. This is base, the basic rule of thumb to keep in mind as a way to avoid being scammed. All right? Money flows toward the author. This means that almost be wary of anything that has an upfront fee. This includes co publish, where you pay half the publish, publishing price. Um, this includes reading fees. This includes, um, we'll publish it if. Um, this one means that there are sometimes people um, who will say, boy, we, um, we liked your book. It really needs a professional editor. We'll publish it if you hire a professional editor to go over it. Here's a professional editor that we like which is oftentimes either their husband under a pseudonym, or their wife under a pseudonym, or themselves under a pseudonym, or something like this. Um, there, are, there are a number of scams out there that are just basically fake agents who exist to cycle all of the um, authors who try to pick them up as an agent through their um, pay for work for hire editing. Yes? Do these people sometimes hide out at conferences? Yes, they do. They go to cons. Mostly, they're not um, willing to pay that much money to go to the con. Usually, you're going to find them online. And they will look very, very prestigious. They'll make themselves look very prestigious. So um, if you want to avoid this, number one, remember this. Number two, you can go to Writer Beware. That's an I. Writer Beware is a um, blog. Look for Roger Beware at Blogspot, a blog run by the Science Fiction Association of America with um, help from the Mystery Writers Association of America. It posts uh, scam watches on um, publishers and contests um, and agents. And if you read through the archives for a few years with, with their scam listings, you'll get a very easy um, clue as to what type of things are truly scams and what type of things aren't. And you'll see they'll post a lot about misguided um, 
misguided uh, people who want to get into publishing but don't know what they're doing. Um, the other place that is pretty good is there's a place called Predators and Editors. who have a, um, a big list of agents and, um, and editors, and it's kind of hard to slog through. It's just a big list, but you can research uh, a given agent, editor, or um, publisher there, and they'll have if they've been recommended or not recommended. Predator spelled like that? Or uh, no, it's probably spelled the real way. Okay. <laughs> it's spelled that way. Is it spelled this way? Yeah. OK, OK, so it is spelled this way. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Um, so anyway, I, I can never remember which one it is, and so I just Google it. Um, I, don't, I Google everything. Google it gets it. And then the other thing is the absolute right. I think it's spelled like that. Absolute right forums. Um, and absolute right forums have um, a place where you can post, hey, has anyone heard of this um, publisher? Tell me what's um, what is going on with them. And a bunch of people will post to a, um, you know, it's like a, a place where a bunch of writers hang out. And they, um, a lot of them are very savvy when it comes to whether something's a scam or not. And almost ev every time I've Googled a publisher, they have already had a thread on them where people talk about it. Um, and the legit ones, often the editors show up on those threads and explain themselves and talk about their, um, their publishing. Um, Game. So um, those are three resources for you to use. Everyone got those down? All right. So you are watching out for anyone who's costing you, charging you up front kind of in an un, in a, um, how shall I say, it's particularly if they're doing it in a hidden way. There are times when you will, if you are self-publishing, change this. Meaning, um, this goes basically for all traditional publishing. But now that self-publishing has taken off, obviously, if you're going to do your own cover art, you're going to pay for it. Um, and if you're going to pay your own copy editor, you're going to pay for it. In those cases, the money doesn't flow toward the author. But uh, you want to be wary of accidentally paying people. Uh, reading fees, agents who charge reading fees, um, um, basically, the, the agents, the big major agents, have gotten together and said, this is something we're not going to do. It's one of the things that's, that is a big clue in separating the, uh, the serious agents from the fake agents. The fake agents survive by charging reading fees or by sending people to um, editing houses and, and whatnot. So the big agents don't. The good agents don't. If an agent charges a reading fee, reading fee you've got a 99 out of 100 chance that that is not a legitimate agent. Yes? What is that decision? Pay me $50 with your manuscript. I will read it and see if I'm willing to take you on as, as a client. They often couch it as, there are so many people who want agents that it's taking me away from my other work. And so therefore, I have to charge a nominal reading fee to make sure the people who are sending to me are serious. That's how they'll write it, um, which sounds very legit when it's couched the right way. Uh, the thing is, agents are talent scouts. This is one of their jobs. They, um, they, the, reading the slush has slowly moved to the agents, and they sift through it and hunt out the authors they think are going to be big. And in exchange, they get a percentage of that author's earnings. And so paying them de-incentivizes them to actually find talented writers and incentivizes them to publish them to, to promote themselves as just something, you know, send me this so I can make the money off of me doing the readings. And it's basically, it's, it's not considered a legit business practice among agents. That, you know, who knows if that will always be the case, but so far it is hold tr held true. Question. So, mm -hmm. Yes. Who will actually make the book for someone like that? Um, he will probably do electronic publishing only. Um, if someone was making the books, it would probably be the same people that you would hire to make the books. Printers, I mean, everybody uses basically the same printers, um, or this, at least the same types of printers. And so 
Um, I recently sold a, one of my novellas to Subterranean Press, small press. They do a print run of, you know, like 10,000 copies. Um, they will ha hire a printer and order them, just like I would if I were self-publishing it. The reason to go with subpress instead of just doing it myself is I don't have time to do all this myself. Um, and it's a really big hassle. Plus, Subterranean Press has a, a very good reputation. Uh, they do good work, and they'll handle all the cover design and all these things for the same reason that I go with Tor. Uh, for, for publishing my books. Uh, subpress, the difference is being a small press, is not going to get into all of the, it's not going to get in the major bookstores usually. Um, they may get small orders from some of the major chains. Uh, subpress does occasionally get into them, but some of the specialty presses really don't. But it's kind of seen as a prestige thing and a, they'll sell them at science fiction conventions, they'll be carried in the science fiction bookstores, and uh, they'll do all the work and pay me in advance. Mm -hmm. You're not like stuck with Tor, but you, you've done so much with them. Is it true that both breach of protocol to go with different publishing houses at all? Or is, is that no. Kind of um, with some caveats. Um, so, when and if you get a um, contract, and we'll start listing these, and I'll leave these up here so you can, you can see them. One of the things that exists in contracts is something we call a right of first refusal. So, uh, right of first refusal is um, usually contains two types of clauses. The first one is you have to show it to us first. If you, for me, for instance, my right of first refusal is tour is for is series tied. So, for instance, I have to show them the next way of King's book. They have rights of first refusal on books in the Stormlight Archive. Anything I write in the Stormlight Archive, they get to see first. Second piece of a right of first refusal clause is usually I am not allowed to take less from another publisher for it. For instance, if Tor offers on it, I can't then go and sell it to someone else for less money. I can, go, I can say no, that deal isn't good enough, and go sell it to someone else for, for more money. You will often see in rights of first refusal clauses things that say if it, you go to someone else and they offer, offer more, we have a chance to beat that price by a certain amount or to match it or beat it, you know. The, the Amazon first breakout, breakthrough novel contract, um, it has the, if you go to someone else, um, our publisher gets a chance to, off, um, to, to match plus 10%, and then you have to take that. Unless then you go to another publisher or the other people, and they, they up it then, it, they always get a chance to match, or, in, or whatever the, the terms are, match plus 10 or something like that, okay? So those are the two parts of a right of first refusal clause. Um, sometimes the, the first clause, um, the first part, you have to show it to us, and it'll, it'll include a, we get a certain period of time in order to look at it. Say we've got a six-month leader on it or whatnot. So these are actually clauses written down official. This isn't just a etiquette. Statement. No, no, this is, this will be in your contract. Okay. Okay? So that's one thing to be aware of that exists. It exists in almost every book contract out there. All right? Things to watch out for is a time period, uh, um, a, a, how should I say, too broad. Watch out for something that's too broad. Did I spell broad right? Um, so something that's too broad would be, for instance, there were certain contracts in the LDS publishing world that had a, gave them a first refusal right on any work produced by the author for the next 10 years. OK? That's crazy. That is absolute crazy talk. Don't sign a contract that says that. Yeah. Um, no. Ev ev thing to remember with contracts is everything is negotiable. Even the stuff they say that's non negotiable, they don't mean it. Okay? Everything is negotiable. So don't, uh, don't sign a sign right of first refusal, it's too broad. Very common rights of first refusal are any book in this series or your next novel in the same genre. If you sell to a YA publisher, usually they will, <coughs> they will say, we want first refusal rights on your next novel made, um, written for the children's market. Very common, very acceptable. It's something that you should say yes to. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you have an agent or 
They are going to pick up on a lot of this stuff, assuming they know what they're doing. Um, but I want you, part of your job is to learn this business so that you can tell if an agent or a, a, um, an entertainment attorney is doing their job. If you see something like this that raises red flag and your attorney or agent doesn't, then they're wrong and you're with the wrong type of attorney or agent. Okay? Now, I'm not going to teach you all the subtle language because I don't know it all. All the very, very subtle languages exist in contracts, but I can tell you the big clauses that are going to be in there and teach you to spot what is industry standard and what is not. All right? And this is very important for you, I feel. So, right of first refusal is one of those things that's going to be in a contract. Now, to answer the original question, um, I've been with Tor for a long time. I've like, liked how Tor has treated me. Can I go somewhere else? Yes, I could. Um, will there be bad feelings? Yes, there will be, but not as bad a fe feeling as you assume there will be. Authors do it all the time. It is usually a, it's, it's, a, it's not burning a bridge, but it's putting up a four construction sign on the bridge that is going to be hard to get around. For instance, some authors will, you know, have just a very bad experience with their publisher and they will go somewhere else. It's very rare they're going to go back. But they could. So the relationship with your agent is completely different. Though. Yes, your relationship with your agent is very different from the agent with your author or with your publisher. Breaking up with an agent is far more rare than moving um, between publishers with, um, with, with something. Yes? Is music then a different, pub this smaller publishing firm sort of a different type of book? It's a novella. Okay. Um, and Tor doesn't do small print run novellas. Uh, so I went with uh, Subterranean Press, and you'll find it very common. Most commonly, if a big author is doing something to another publisher, it's for a specialty book like this. Um, I mean, Legion is, um, is 17,000 words. It's tiny uh, for a book of mine. It wouldn't do well. It, it, anyway, just not, so yeah. No, like, for oh, no, not at all. Um, and in fact, if I wrote this as, if I novelized it, I would then take it to tour. Um, so... So there are no hard feelings. My ed editor at Tor actually gave me feedback on it before I took it to Subterranean Press, just for, fr for free. Um, another question. OK, getting a new editor. This is a side topic, but we'll go ahead and mention it. It is possible to get a new editor at the same publisher if it isn't working with you. Um, it doesn't happen that commonly, but I'd say it's more common than breaking up with um, an agent is. Um, you, so you should know that it is possible. It depends on the publisher. If it's a large publisher, it's more possible. If it's a small publisher, obviously they only have two editors. It, you know, jumping from one to the other is going to do you much less good because usually the, if there's only two editors, they'll have a very similar editorial style and things like that, but it is possible. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I hope it never has to happen to you. What happens more often is you get orphaned which is your editor gets a better job at a new company. Um, like most businesses, one of the main ways to move up is to move to another company. And so then your editor leaves. They have acquired the books. They were shepherded them, and they fall in someone else's lap. And what happens there can, you know, it, it, can, it can make a major stumble for the series. Um, it happens all the time, though. Um, it happened to me with Alcatraz. Um, we lost our editor after the first book. Um, and so, yeah, you'll, you have that possibility. It's one of the nice things about having an agent that you've chosen wisely with and well, because the agent will remain the same generally throughout your career, but you'll generally work with several editors. All right. Other questions there? The, um, another clause in your contract is going to be, uh, we'll just kind of start from the beginning. You will have an advance. This is all for novels, by the way. We'll talk about short stories separately. You will have an advance. The contract will spell out how much your advance is and your break points on your advance, your payment um, when you get paid. Usually, I've seen it like this. One half on signing, one half on publication. That's very common. Um, also common is the one-third signing, one-third acceptance, 
meaning acceptance of the manuscript. Um, you've edited it and revised it according to their, um, their desire. One third then on pub. Um, once you start getting to really big advances, they start chopping and dicing this thing right and left. Uh, I think on um, Stormlight Archive, we have one part on signing, one part on delivery, one part on acceptance, one part on hardcover publication, one part on paperback publication. Well, no, and one part on bestseller list um, registration. So we actually have, we have six, I think, or something like that. Um, because my advance now um, is directly tied to where I place on the bestseller list. So if I hit number one, um, I make you know, a big ton uh, more money than if I make number seven or something like that. Um, and this is all advance against royalties. Advance is against royalties. You all, I've explained this to you. You all understand that? No one's confused by advance against royalties? OK, good. You don't need to pay the advance back ever unless you don't deliver the manuscript. Sometimes they'll go after you on that case. All right. So um, that's a piece of a contract. Another piece of the contract then will be royalties. Um, I believe I gave you a breakdown on royalties before, did I not? I don't think I'll spend time going over that again. You'll know what your, um, your royalty should be. Just a reminder, industry standard on hard cat covers is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Industry standard on paperbacks is going to be somewhere between 6 and 10 percent, usually more around the 8 percent. And that's off cover price. Industry standard um, right now, unfortunately, on ebooks is 25 percent of net. Net being defined as proceeds paid to the publisher, not after they've taken out all their expenses. If anything, ha they're, they're saying after expenses, big red flag, OK? Watch out for after expenses, because that's what we term Hollywood accounting. Um, they use it in the music industry also. It means that uh, you get an advance, and then they count profits after their investors have been paid back which means they don't make profits because their investors get all the money. This is why Hollywood films can make no money. Okay? Lord of the Rings movies did not make profit according to Hollywood accounting. You understand this? We've talked about this. That's what the big lawsuit was about. Um, so <coughs> there will be a royalty claim. Let's talk about some things we haven't talked about as much. Um, next big one is rights. Rights granted. OK, under here, the big one you're going to look at is um, translation. All right. Uh, translation rights are who gets to choose when it gets published in various languages um, and who gets the money from when it is uh, published in various languages. Usually, um, these in initial contracts, the offer is not very good because it's something the people look at these numbers and don't pay attention to these. However, this is something that um, they are usually very willing to bend on. Um, in our industry, basically, there should be, you should be giving no translation rights to the publisher, and you should keep 100%. Two, two caveats on, under that. One, world English. I've talked about world English before. Some publishers are strict on the we need to keep world English rights. Uh, this will be more common with someone like Bloomsbury, who did not have a, an American publishing arm before Harry Potter and has been kicking themselves ever since. Because uh, Bloomsbury published Harry Potter, but they sold the rights to Scholastic. So now they have an American publishing arm. And anything they acquire from the American publishing arm is really their biggest, they're a British company. And so they're going to say, no, we have to have World English. If we buy something, we publish it in the UK. Usually, they will want World English, but they will pay you to, um, to keep them meaning they will pay you to let them have them. They'll up the advance a little bit. Uh, on our initial offer from Tor, they offered us World English for 5,000 more. We actually turned them down. Um, but they did, they did offer extra for World English. So um, the other one is North American Spanish. There's, um, there's a decent argument, particularly among some of the YA publishers. Um, and middle grade uh, publishers to keep North American Spanish rights. Um, they're not worth a terribly large amount of money, but a, a lot of them have initiatives where they like to translate things in Spanish through the school market and things like that. And that's, there, there's nothing wrong with letting them have that. Does North America include Mexico and Central America? Um, it includes, well, it includes everything in North America. 
one thing to keep in mind, though, um, right now, um, uh, book sales, particularly for fiction, in places we call emerging markets, are um, very, very tepid. Um, Brazil does have some um, have a decent publishing arm going, um, but basically, I have not seen any other. And this is I'm I'm restricted to science fiction and fantasy on this. I could be wrong about others, but I haven't seen any other. Um, emerging markets have serious publishing um, deals happening. So um, none of my books, even though I've, you know, none of my books have been translated into um, North American Spanish. Um, they've been tra translated into Spain Spanish, but not into Mexican Spanish. Um, there's just not enough of a market, even for someone like myself. So um, I did get Scholastic North American Spanish, um, and they didn't end up using them. The books wouldn't have translated that well anyway. But um, so those are those are two little caveats. Uh, but you should be keeping basically everything else uh, when it comes to translation rights. All right. Another thing under here is uh, book club, and the reverse is true on this one. Normally, the publisher keeps the book club rights. Okay. What's that? What's book club. Uh, book club. The Book Club of America, Book of the Month Club, have you heard it called that? Um, these are Book of the Month, uh, Science Fiction Book Club. Anyone belong to the Science Fiction Book Club ever? Um, these are these things you get mailers for them occasionally um, that say, you know, it's like the, you probably did it with CDs back in the day, if any of you did, the, like the music club where you buy like 10 for a penny and then they send you one every month, right? Um, they do this with books too. Um, and the Science Fiction Book Club is actually one of the strong, stronger book clubs out there. Basically, what will happen is um, Tor will sell them the book club rights, and you will keep, you'll get 50%, and it'll go against your advance. It'll count as immediate royalties. And they'll sell to the book club for 2000 bucks, of which you'll get 1000 applied against your advance. Um, and then the book club will release an edition. Um, and... The general argument on book club is people who buy book club books have been proven to not really buy books other places. So it's either be in the book club or don't be in the book club. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of the Scholastic Book Club, at least, right? You've heard of that? I'm thinking of book club that I was in when I was a little kid. Okay. Like yeah, that's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's very similar to the Scholastic Book Club where they hand around those sheets in class. This is a bigger deal in children's than it is in adult, but it's still, um, it's still decent. So, um, so yeah, usually the publisher keeps book club rights. Um, right now, um, e-book rights are a big battleground. Uh, most publishers have, have been issued a sort of command from higher up that they cannot buy books unless they get the e-book rights as well. Um, and most people who have had ebook rights come out that are then selling to publishers are then pulling their own ebooks as part of that deal. And from then on, the, um, the publisher retains rights. This is the big battleground, and this is the big one that um, the self publishing crowd is saying this is why you shouldn't sign um, a, a contract with a New York publisher. Um, and they have some legitimate gripes. Industry standard is 25% of net. Um, the small presses, in order to be more enticing, are doing the 50% that everyone says should be more standard. These guys were doing 50%. Um, both Subterranean and, and Tachyon do 50%. I did not sell to Subterranean ebook rights on Legion. I retained them. All right. So uh, Tor would not um, will prob would probably not publish without getting ebook rights in this day and age. I haven't fought that battle. I don't know if I want to. But at the same time, I'm selling twice as many copies in ebook as I am in, um, in paper right now. Um, dramatic rights is the next. This is film, television, and stage. Uh, you should be keeping your dramatic rights. Most publishers, they want these, but they are book publishers first. And they will, every contract I've, I've seen, they will bend on this unless. It, you're part of something where they're like pitching the concept to you. 
Uh, there's like this thing that Scholastic did called the 39 Clues. I don't know if you saw that, but it was a Scholastic had this bit great concept. They went to a bunch of authors and said, hey, do a book in this series. And in that case, most of these rights are going to be, it's going to be a different thing. Uh, you could imagine why, because they're approaching you. Um, it's their property, okay? So um, those are the big ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right, audio. I just wrote audio. There you go, audio. Um, yeah, um, I should have just scribbled that one. Audio, uh, good question. Audio rights are negotiable. It's been my experience. Almost all publishing uh, publishers have an audio rights group with them. Audio rights were not worth as much five years ago as they are now. Uh, because Audible has allowed audiobooks to hit more mainstream. And instead of releasing $50 audiobooks, people can usually buy them for 10 now. Um, so, or, yeah. Um, so, audiobooks are a bigger deal than they used to be. Um, but audiobooks are generally negotiable, meaning you can say, well, give me a little bit extra advance um, and I'll let you have the audiobook. Or keep it and sell it to an audiobook company yourself. It's possible. Okay. It's possible. Remember, you'll get an offer, and your offer may say, um, you know, we'll give you 10000 and here's the rights we're taking. And you say, no, you can't have translation. They could very well come back and say, well, we, um, we can't do that um, at that price. We'll give you less. And you have to decide what it's worth. Usually, um, the ones that, um, that, that people are a stickler on are this one, and this one, and this one. They know that dramatic rights are usually not standard, and they know that most of the foreign translation rights, other than World English, are not standard. And so if they're battlegrounds, it's going to be on audio, ebook, um, and World English. Yeah. <coughs> video games. Video, dramatic includes video games, yes. Um, though often it's in, a, in its own separate little thing, video games. OK. Other questions right here? Yes, and then I get 25% of what they get. Okay, so lower than what you would normally get if you were publishing your own English. Yes, oh yes, much lower than if uh, you were publishing your own. You'll get 75%, but no, actually you'll get, here, here's the thing. Um, and this is, this is why the big battleground. Let's say you've got, a, um, for ease of computation, a $10 book. All right? Normally, with most um, e-book, um, if you do it yourself, you're going to make $750 per book. Right? If you are with a publisher, they make 70, 750 and you make 25% of that, which is a uh, math major. It's 25% of seven. It's going to be just over two bucks, right? Or no, just, just under two bucks. So you'll make like, what, 175 or something like that. OK? Don't laugh at my, um, my terrible math. So. Yeah, yeah, this is going to Amazon or whatever, the, 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 the seller. So 25%, um, so it's not a 25% versus 75% comparison. It is a 25%, it's a 75% versus 25% of 75% per of comparison. Okay, yes? Um, it depends. Um, a negotiation like this for a contract really depends on how excited they are about it whether other people are offering on it, you're, you're as a new author and as an established author. The only thing you have as a bargaining chip is to walk away. And how badly they don't want you to walk away determines how many concessions they'll make. And so if you've given it to three publishers and they all love it and are bidding against each other, you going with one of those others, like there's a legitimate walk threat. If you've given it to a bunch of publishers and you've spent 10 years trying to get published and one has finally said yes, your legitimacy of walking goes way down and your opportunity cost of walk, walking goes way down. And so at that point, wh whether you, know, you walk or not will really be dependent on how bad the contract is. Now, if you've been self-publishing 
and you are making a certain amount of money every month self-publishing, it lets you know. Let, let's look at this thing again. Let's say that you know you're you're selling a hundred books a month month at seven fifty. Okay, hundred books a month. Um, I I I know some people who do hundred books a month. That it's it's not that hard of a level to get to. It's not a blockbuster amount by any means, but um, set 100 books times 750 means you're making, what, 750 bucks a month. So 750 bucks a month off of a single book means that you, well, they're not going to be selling for 750. Let's, let's, let's be realistic. You're probably selling them for 299. Um, so let's, let's, let's make this more real world. $2.99 is your book by yourself. You're making about $2 off of it um, just for ease. You're selling under buck books. You're making $200 a month. Okay? The publisher is probably not going to price theirs at $2.99. They're probably going to price theirs at $6.99, um, of which your 25% of 75% is, somebody tell me, that has a calculator or that is like a genius. Okay? None of us are geniuses. What's that? 1.3. 1 1.3? Yeah. Okay. So 130. That's probably what the more a more reasonable distinction. You're going to be making less per copy, and the question is, will they then sell way more copies than you are selling? And who knows? I mean, 100 copies a month is still a, um, a pretty solid sales point for um, a book. Um, by contrast, Mistborn sells 500 copies a month in print. I don't know what it sells in ebook because I don't get monthly reports. But print, I sell about 500 copies a month um, of it. Uh, one of my standalones, uh, like Elantris or uh, Warbreaker, sells around 300. So, yeah. Um, the reason they're bad about being reported is that in print books we have something called the Nielsen reports, and Nielsen doesn't do the eBooks because Amazon has no reason to offer them the, money, the, the statistics. Nielsen would report them if Amazon did. Amazon doesn't have to. The reason Nielsen works is because all the big um, point of sale um, distributors like uh, Barnes and Noble, and there was enough competition in there that they all wanted to know what everyone else was selling. And so they gave their numbers, and in return, got everyone else's numbers. And that's how the deal worked. Um, and so it's the Nielsen ratings for books. But uh, with eBooks, Amazon is the big player in the field. They have no reason to give up that information. Um, and so they don't. So I didn't think Nielsen ratings. Mm -hmm. Anyone look them up? No. Uh, anyone can't look them up, except um, Amazon did a deal with them to get your print Nielsen ratings through Amazon if you're a, a self-published author. So you can get your Nielsen ratings through them. There is some concern of what, how accurate they are through Amazon. Um, uh, some of the comparisons aren't necessary. But I get them through my agent. I actually don't get them through Tor. Your publisher will probably not give you these because um, the publisher basically has, the, it's not really a, um, it's just that the publisher, the people who get this are the marketing department who's paying attention to it, and they'll share it with the CEO, but the editor doesn't ever see it, and the editor would be the one who would give it to you. I get it from my agent as a service provided by Jabberwocky. It is a service that Jabberwocky provides for all its clients. Um, some agents do that. Uh, some agents don't. One of the reasons why I like Joshua. Um, can you publish through multiple online publishers? Yes. Through yeah. Your yes, but like um, the rights with that usually are, remember when you're publishing with a, um, if you're self-publishing, you are, you are not giving up any rights to Amazon any more than you're giving up rights to Barnes & Noble when they sell your book in the store. Uh, the thing that Amazon and um, all, basically all of them have is if you put it on sale for one group, you have to put it on sale for the other group. So for instance, you can't put it on Amazon for $2.99 according to Amazon's contract and $1.99 on your website. You have to put it at $2.99 on your website also. And if you lower the price on your website, Amazon has the right to lower the price on their website. OK? So that's the big question is, will you reach more people at $2.99 on your own, or will you release, reach more people at $6.99 through the publisher? Uh, who knows? So all right. 
So there's your rights. All right. Everyone pretty, uh, yeah, go ahead. I have a question about um, in the negotiations, if, you yes. lower, if they lower your advance, doesn't it really not make a difference if you, I mean, if it's. Yes. Okay. Let's, let's talk about advances. Good question. Um, assuming royalties are the same, and they're going to be the same for you as everyone else unless you hit the, the level of uh, popularity like right above Robert Jordan. Um, and I'm not actually sure. I haven't seen his contracts. He might have gotten the slightly better contracts. I haven't seen those. But let's just assume um, that that's kind of like the break point. And after, you know, that's like the, the real time sells like a million copies in hardcover in the US, uh, between 500,000 and a million. Um, so we go, you go to the next popularity level of like the two to four, five million rip mark. Maybe they are getting, but everybody else underneath is getting basically the same royalty rate. So the question is, if you're getting the same royalty rate as Brandon, why does it matter if you're advanced? You could have your advance be a dollar, and at the end of the day, if we both sell the same number of copies, we have earned the same amount of money. And that is true. Um, and that is one argument philosophically um, that some people follow. This is, um, you'll find a lot of authors that, were, that publish with Bain, um, which is a smaller house, much more friendly, much more kind of author-oriented than the larger houses. Bain will not pay big advances, but will pay the industry standard royalties, and you'll end up earning the same amount on the end. Um, the argument the other way is the more money that the publisher has to sink into the book up front, the more publicity and uh, the more important a book will seem to the publisher. Whenever you see big announcements of books, it's because the publisher has paid a lot. The publisher paid $5 million for this book. It must you know, they have sunk this much money into it, they're going to have to do something, right? Uh, something big to make it work. And anytime you see news on a book, it's going to be because they got a big deal. And so the big deal can be its own buzz. And there's the, the it is a sunk fa cost fallacy. It is a fallacy, but it is the feeling that if you spent this much money for a book up front, you better then sink a whole bunch more into it to make sure that it's success. success. Otherwise, you look terrible and you've just wasted all this money, right? So that's the back and forth argument. You don't want to end up, as I've told you before, um, it is bad to get so large in advance that um, you are seen as a failure where you otherwise might not have been seen as one. We talked about that in class. Um, but you do want to get a larger advance to basically cement your place in the publisher um, in, in their eyes. Everyone in the company will raise eyebrows if you get uh, six figures for your advance as a new author, and they'll say, I have to find out what this book is so, we can, so I can be, know about it, because it's obviously going to be one of our lead titles coming up. It has its own momentum. But really, at the end of the day, a good agent and a good publisher, what they're looking to do is find the fair price for a book what, so that you're getting up front basically what the book's going to earn in a year is what's considered the, the kind of fair price. You get that money up front, you get the interest on it, um, so it is a little bit more money, and that's, in most cases, what they're looking to do. Very new authors, that's going to be lower than that. Very established authors, it's going to be ha higher than that, for reasons we talked about in class. Other questions? Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, right. Your agent will consult with you, and then you will say yes or no, and they'll give you advice. A good agent is not going to say, you know, is not going to make the decision for you. They're going to try and weigh all these things for you and give you advice and say, I wouldn't sign this contract because of this, but if you decide to, here are the ramifications. Go into it with your eyes open, and if that's something you want, go for it. Joshua wanted to take Elantris and shop it around. He felt he could get a bigger advance if we played the field. Um, he was probably right. I wanted to be a tour for, re for kind of um, thematic reasons. I like Tor's books. Um, I like, it's where Robert Jordan was, and I was a big fan of Robert Jordan. I liked their covers, and I liked their hardcover philosophy, and I said I will take less to be with Tor. Um, so, and um, it ended up working out for me. So, um, there you go. Those are the, the big ones. Uh, let's talk about some of the smaller clauses that you might run into, um, or that actually you will run into. You will run into usually an indemnity clause. Oh boy. Uh, attorneys, tell me how to spell this thing. 
Indemnity. Is that right? Indemnity? Um, that's a big word for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it basically just means who gets sued. Meaning, the indemnity clause means you promise that this book is your own and you are not plagiarizing it. Um, you promise that, you know, that, uh, that you are not using anyone in it in a way that could, you could be sued for libel. Um, you are um, basically doing everything legal and on the up and up. And if you aren't, we can pass the buck along to you. And if we get sued, it's you getting sued. Basically, it's a standard thing um, in a contract like this. But it is something to be aware of. Yeah. Any characters are, fi are fictional or used fictitiously. Yes, that thing. Mm -hmm. So um, you also have um, kind of a copyright clause. All this should basically say is the publisher will register a copyright for the work in the author's name. For whatever reason, that's what the, the publisher does. Uh, it costs them like 50 bucks. They will register the copyright for you. The Really bad contracts exist out there which try to right grab on the copyright, in which they say the copyright in, um, characters and series title will be owned by the publisher. Um, and that is something to be very careful of. Granted, if it's something like 39 Clues, where they've come to you and said, we're doing this thing. Do you want to be part of it? Then you're entering into a work for hire agreement, and that will be expected. For example, my um, contracts with the Harriet explicitly state the copyright belongs to Bandersnatch, which is their company. They don't belong to me. And it spells out the characters and situations and things belong to Bandersnatch and not to me. You would have the same contract if you were writing for George Lucas. So then you can't actually write your own, like you couldn't write anything. I could not write my own Wheel of Time books. That is correct. And, um, that would be very standard. It is not standard if it is what we call an author property that you have brought to the publisher yourself. And it will be most everything that you guys will work with. Um, yeah. Right. That you have to approach with the publisher directly. Um, they don't love it, I'll tell you that. But um, various publishers are going to have their own quirks for this. For instance, Bain has no problem with it. Um, and in, in your bang contracts, you will probably be required to put your book up, not required, but strongly, heavily suggest that you should put your book up on the Bain Free Library, where they put up on their website all the first books of every author's series, basically, for free to read an e-book um, to try and get people hooked on the series. And they kind of, they rotate those sometimes too, so there's like other books. Um, it's a great resource. And Bain also does this thing where if you belong to their subscriber, subscription to their club, um, they've got this like publisher club that's actually pretty neat, and you get arcs of all the books. You get the ebook um, to read early when it's put up on the bay. You know, they'll they'll put it up early for you, and then they'll send you an arc, and you're paying whatever a certain amount a month to just get all of this. So it's kind of a nifty thing they do. And I don't know how that looks in the contracts because I haven't ever signed a bang contract before. Bain is an interesting company. Tom Doherty, who runs Tor, owns 50% of it, but is a silent par partner because it's his competitor. <laughs> um, so, all right. What else am I missing? I forgot to bring my contracts in to look at them. Um, but I think we're hitting all of the, um, the big things. We'll go into the littler things, like um, there will be a due date. There will be a reversion of rights. Um, mm, let's see. Is there anything else in these, both of these things? Due dates, um, by the way, in publishing tend to actually be pretty flexible. They put this on here, but they're used to working with crazy creative authors. Um, and if missing your due date is, you, is, is a bad thing, but it happens all the time. So don't stress it too much. Um, as a newer author, it serves you very well to hit your due dates um, so you can have a publication date, but yeah. Oftentimes in their offers, they'll, continue, um, they'll include a marketing plan. 
Um, and you can get that into the contract if you want to. Uh, marketing plan is, you know, they are required to send you on a book tour of a certain number of cities. And you can actually get it written into there that they're required to do that. Or they're required to do such and such thing or such and such. All of this stuff, you can, you can get anything in the contract that you want to. The question is the push and shove, whether it's worth what they're going to require of you to put it in there. But you could get a marketing plan. If they, when they make offers, they love to throw out marketing plans. And then they love to not put them in the contracts because they talk big in marketing plans. So, yeah. Kind of a tangent to that, question to that. When they fly you around, do they? They pay. Oh, OK. Well, I mean, yeah. my question is, like, do they fly you first class? And why do they do this? Or is it kind of? How much are you earning them? <laughs> um, there are authors who have in their contract that the publisher is required to fly them, fly them first class if, wherever they go. I'm not going to say if that's me. Um, because I am forbidden by contract to talk about whether or not I get certain perks that other authors might not get. Um, there can be NDAs in here. There can be NDAs in here. Um, but um, you know, certain authors require first class. Uh, you're better off not asking for it until you are a big enough deal that they won't laugh at you. And when you're a big enough deal that they won't laugh at you, then they're probably offering it anyway. Um, but yes, they do pay for everything. Uh, they put you up in hotels um, and things like that. And there can be NDAs in here. There's an NDA in my, um, my Robert Jordan contract. There's not NDAs in any of my other contracts, really. Um, but there are certain things that you know, are, are, are I've asked to not make pu comp public knowledge in my contracts. And you may have things like that. Like if your royalty rate gets boosted up, they may say, don't tell everybody. And so stuff like that could, could exist in there. There are certain perks you can get where they're like, don't tell everyone else this. Um, so um, you don't remember what reversion of rights is? We talked about it already. It should spell out when you get the rights back so you could sell them again. All right. All right, a uh, few th things on short story contracts, just in case you're interested. Usually what they're buying is first serial rights. Um, it, could, it could say first North American serial rights. It could say first world English serial rights. Um, basically, they get a chance to publish it in their magazine first. And then they will usually um, have an exclusivity period, meaning um, frequently it's 12 or 18 months. They get uh, to have the story exclusively for that time. And after that, you can, you can sell second serial rights if you want, or second, third, fourth, fifth. I mean, if a magazine wants to do reprints, there are some that do reprints. You'd be free to sell as a reprint to a magazine. Um, you'd be free to put it up in your website. Um, you'd be free to put it in an anthology. All of these things after that exclusivity period. Uh, usually, they're going to pay a certain number of cents per word. Um, one cent on the low end for, um, for kind of more semi pro zines and things. Up to the highest is usually around 25 cents um, per word. Uh, 25 cents per word, uh, yeah. Um, for some really professional publications, I think Tor.com pays 20 cents or 25 cents a word. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's one of the other magazines. Tor might pay the standard five to seven. Um, but five to seven is what you're going to see mostly for the pro zines. A couple of them, they'll make, like, try to make a big splash by offering this. But those will usually be web only sorts of things. Like I think sci fiction was paying like 25 cents a word back when it existed. Um, and so you know, that's what they'll do. And they will um, usually say up to you know, a certain amount, up to five grand. And then like, you know, it could be. 20 cents for um, up to five grand, and then after that, one cent per word there thereafter, or to just a maximum of five grand, and anything after that, you just get five grand for it. Um, am I missing anything in, in that's different in short story contracts? Occasionally they'll ask for electronic if they have a. Oh yeah, yeah, they will ask for electronic. Very common to ask for electronic, um, but um, usually their electronic rights. Um, the clauses will require that it be bundled, meaning they don't get to sell the short story by itself from you. They have to bundle it with the rest of the magazine. They can sell the magazine 
in short, in, in electronic form for, uh, for a fee, but they can't sell just your book. Um, that's not always the case, though. For instance, Tor.com has the right to sell the story on its own, but Tor.com puts them out for free. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not big money when they then put it on Amazon and, and kick back 25% to you or whatever. Um, so, all right. That's, your, that's basically your contract thing, what you should be looking at when you're um, signing a contract. Uh, go immediately to make sure they're not grabbing too many of your rights or your copyright. Make sure the advance is reasonable. Um, not paying advance is usually a sign of a somewhat um, um, newer publisher, how shall we say. Uh, Joshua says he won't work with anyone that doesn't pay in advance, period. Um, they've got to pay in advance. He won't even sell, like, to my friends, um, miniatures rights without making them pay 100 bucks because he says they have to put it advance forward to make sure that they're serious. Uh, that's one of just jo Joshua's laws. Pay us, even if it's just a little bit for, for simple rights, pay us and we'll listen. If you come to us with no money, then, yeah, you're getting our name for free uh, attached to your product. So... Um, be wary of that. So, getting an agent. The thing about this is, it's one of the big questions people always want to ask. And yet, getting an agent, I don't know that there's much more to say other than what we've already said. I've told you what an agent does. I've told you why you would consider getting one and why you wouldn't consider getting one. Um, and then it comes down to how do you land one of these agents. They are more difficult to find than editors because agents do programming conventions much less frequently. Um, they, they are in the limelight, for whatever reason, much less frequently than editors are. And I think I mentioned to you before, editors seem to be like, you know, they, they're the behind-the-scenes heroes on all books. And when they get to be at a convention where suddenly they're not behind the scenes anymore, they usually love it. And they're like, yay, people are paying attention to the awesome job I do. Um, whereas the, the agents um, don't usually do that as much, don't have that same sort of attitude about it. So landing an agent can be difficult. Um, I got my agent by simply meeting him at the Nebula Awards taking his card, sending him something, getting it rejected, sending him something else, having him like it but still reject it, sending him something else, having him like it, still reject it but give me feedback on it, did that three or four more times till he called me and said, you know, you really should revise one of these, and then I sold Elantris, and then I called him up and said, I do want to have an agent, would you represent me? Uh, that was my route. Uh, I believe Pat Rothfuss's route is um, that he had a story in Writers of the Future, did very well, uh, Kevin Anderson was one of the Writers Futures judges that year. He went to Matt Bialer, who is Roth, Pat's um, agent, who is also uh, Kevin's agent, and said, hey, this thing's really good. It sounds like he's got a full novel complete for it. Um, I'd look into it if I were you. I think it's a great, it's a great story. Matt read it, liked it, um, and took on uh, Pat as a client, I believe. You'll have to ask Pat that, because I, be, I could be garbling a few of the details. Um, but that's how he did it recently. Um, so he did it the get an agent first way, but I really landed an agent by selling a book and then calling an agent and saying, would you represent me? Uh, Dan did the same thing. Dan sold, had an offer on the book. Um, he researched agents, uh, found one he liked, called her up, said, would you be interested in looking at the book? She did. He actually called several of them and sent them all the book. He then went and kind of interviewed each of them after they've read the book, uh, picked the one he liked the most and went with them. Um, so... Boy, uh, do all the things I said for editors. Start making a list of the big agents. Um, but the thing to remember is there are a ton, a ton of scam agents out there. Much more than there are scam publishers because it's easy to spot a scam publisher. They're asking you for money. And if you go and you look at, the, at what they put out, they will not be putting out any books that are on bookstores shelves. And you can say, OK. They're either a scammer or they're a small press that doesn't get bookstore distribution. Let's go you know, to absolute right and see which of the two they are. 
if it's you know a, a reputable small press, people will say, yeah, yeah, they've been around for years. Um, they have very good contracts. Yes, they don't get bookstore placement, but they have all these other distribution methods, and they, they're um, well regarded. Nothing wrong with that, uh, publishing with them. Or you'll get back a, yeah, they've been, had lots of disputes with their authors. They never actually pay out on, on things. You know, they, um, they, they make lots of promises. They make rights grabs, but you never end up actually seeing books. Then you know that is a publisher you don't want to go to. Agents um, don't actually produce anything. And so it's much harder to track down. You can track down a publisher who's producing terrible books. But an agent, it can be a little more difficult. You go to a convention, they hand you a card and say, hey, I'm a literary agent. Um, send me something. Um, and then you go to their website and it just says, hey, we're a literary agency, um, yada, yada, yada. And you're like, but who, you know, who are you? Well, there is no, um, there's no, no one's out there um, deciding who can be an agent and who can't be. You, any of you could say literary agent and put it on your business card and then hand them out to people. Um, and so the best way to judge if, a, if, a, if an agent is legit or not is to ask them for a list of clients or look for one on their website and see who their clients are and see if you can find their bookstores on shelves. Yes, yeah, that could be good, um, but agenting works in general. There are one of two ways someone becomes an agent. Number one, they apprentice under another agent, and they will be able to give you a list of books they've worked on, even if they've just started their own agency. They'll say, I was with you know, Jabberwocky Joshua Bilmas for 10 years. I apprenticed there. I worked on all these books, and now I'm starting my own agency. That, you can say, it would be a, an OK sort of thing to do. Usually agents don't do that. Usually they wait until the agency they're part of, till the person running it actually passes away, and the agency then splits into all the sub-agents running their own agencies. That's what happened. Um, Joshua and a guy named Richard Curtis um, and several other people were working for Scott Meredith um, as his sub-agents. Scott Meredith died, and then they all went and took the clients that they had been working with under Scott Meredith and started their own agencies. Uh, that happens very frequently. Another main way that people become agents is what you just said. They work in the publishing industry for a long time and they decide to switch over. Almost always, those agents will go to a, a big agency house and say, I want to do this. Um, will you bring me on as an agent? And they'll work there for five years or so before they make their, do their own. When they walk, they don't keep the contracts, by the way. Their authors may go with them, but the contracts they negotiated under that, um, you know, Joshua's assistant, when he negotiates a comp contract, he's negotiating it for the company, which is owned by Joshua. So those contracts stay with Joshua, even if the agent moves on. But you are always kind of, it's understood that you're welcome to follow that agent because that's the person you've been working with um, and things like that. So, um, so yes, people do that, but a lot of time they're apprenticing. Uh, they, you should be able to get a really good feel for their professional um, agent by simply having a good client list. Um, you email a few clients on that list through your website, so you can ask them what they think of their agent um, and, and go from there. But do beware of the scams. Um, it's not 100% anymore, but agents usually are going to live in New York. If they do not live in New York, then I would say, this one isn't as hard fast, but I'd say nine out of, time ten, nine out of 10 times, they're not an agent who, who can help you. They may be a Hollywood agent, who has decided they're going to jump over and start representing books. Um, well, the reason to get an agent, the primary one that I listed for you guys, is that they will have done all this legwork and knowing all the publishers and the different editors that work for the different publishers and the different thematic styles of all the publishers. And they will be able to lend you, you know, a decade or more experience of knowing all those people so that you then don't have to have done all that legwork yourself. Um, and it, that's, that's the most valuable thing that an agent will offer you. Um, the second most valuable thing being a real working knowledge of the public in industry so they can work on contracts with you and all that stuff. Um, someone who's living in LA knows nothing about either of those things most of the times. That said, there are a few solid agents who used to live in New York and have moved away and then just fly back frequently. So don't take this as an, um, as an overriding um, overriding thing, but be very wary of an agent who doesn't live in New York. The agents, the reason being that all the publishing houses are in New York. In science fiction fantasy, there's only one major um, uh, publishing house that isn't in New York, and that is Bain. 
which is um, down south along the coast a little ways. Um, there's also Wizards of the Coast, if you want to count them, but they aren't accepting author property um, books any longer um, in there in Seattle. Uh, but everybody's in New York, and so the agents are very frequently going and meeting the editors at all these parties and things, and they are making sure to keep all of their contact tax up to date. That's their job. So if someone lives in Denver and comes to you and says, hey, I'm a literary agent, be um, a little bit wary. Um, and if you ask for a client list, uh, they may be pretty legit and give you a client list. Um, and it will be full of small regional publications from people like Deseret Book and things like that, which would be fine if that's what you're wanting to do. Um, there probably are a few agents that are legit that are doing that. But they won't be, you know, they may send your book to New York, but they're not going to sell your book in New York. They'll say they have all the contacts and things, but if they haven't actually sold authors there, then they don't. Okay? Don't just take any old agent. Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, it's a very big red flag. Uh, agents usually have, um, are not, uh, unless there's a good reason for it. For instance, if you have just one Writers of the Future, an agent walks up to you and gives you their card, there's, there's a decent chance they're legit. Um, if you have won a big literary prize, or if you're at a convention and you have won, you know, there's a short story contest and you've won the short story contest, and the agent comes up and says, hey, looks like you've got some writing chops. Go ahead, here's my card, go ahead, me, if you've got a, a novel, send me sample chapters. That could be a very legit agent. Um, chances are anyone else who gives you a card is not. It means they're actively soliciting clients. It means they don't work for a big agency where the name is bringing in clients. Um, there's a chance that they might still be legit, but I've never actually run into one who was. I've met into a lot of well-intentioned people who think they're legit who do that, and none of them actually turned out to be. Did you have someone do that? No. no okay. Yeah, yeah, they shouldn't walk up. Then they do that at cons sometimes. They go out handing out cards. I'm a literary agent. I'm a literary agent. I'm a literary, literary agent. Yeah, red flag. Um, pretty big one. You had one back there? What's your take on having advances routed to the agent? Uh, advances should be routed to the agent. It's what happens. Um, if your agent, if you pick up an agent, all the money is going to go to the agent, and then it's going to flow toward you, um, which is still the money flowing toward the author. Um, but it's fine if it goes publisher, agent, author. That's what's going to happen. Uh, you should be watching to make sure that, that you know, it's legit. They will give you the royalty statements that go along with it. And you can look and see if they're cutting you the right amount of it as a check. Um, but they will, they will get all the money.